said Mr. Dovetail quietly. Do you swear that if I do this, my daughter won't be harmed and that I'll be permitted to go home to her? Of course, Dovetail, said Spittleworth lightly, already moving to the door of the cell. The quicker you complete the task, the sooner you'll see your daughter again. Now every night we'll collect these tools from you and every morning they'll be brought back to you because we can't have a prisoner's keeping the means of to dig themselves out, can we? Good luck, Dovetail, and what work hard. I look forward to see I look forward to seeing my foot. And with that, Roach cut the rope binding Mr. Dovetail's wrist and rammed the torch he was carrying into the bracket on the wall. Then Spittleworth, Roach, and the other soldiers left the cell. The iron door closed and a, with a clang. A key turned the lock, and Mr. Dovetail was left alone with the enormous piece of wood, his chisel, and his knives. Chapter 27 Kidnapped When Daisy arrived home from school, that afternoon, playing with her bandalore, as she went, she headed as usual to her father's workshop to tell him about their day. However, to her surprise, as she found the workshop locked up, assuming that Mr. Dovetail had finished work early and was back in the cottage, she walked through the front door with her school books under her arm. Daisy stopped dead in the doorway, staring around. The furniture was gone, as were the pictures on the walls, the rug on the floor, the lamps, even the stove. She opened her mouth to call her father, but in that instant, a sack of thrown, a sack was thrown over her head, and a hand clapped over her mouth. Her school books were, and her bandolier fell with the series of thuds on the floor. Daisy was lifted off her feet, struggling wildly, then carried out of the house and slung into the back of a wagon. If you make a noise, said a rough voice in her ear, we'll kill your father. Daisy, whose drawn breath into her lungs to scream, let out it quiet let it let it out quietly instead. She felt the wagon lurched and heard in jingling of horses of harness and trotting hoops as they began to move. By the turn that the wagon took, Daisy knew that they were heading out of the city within the city, and by the sounds of the market traders and other horses, she realized they were moving out into the wider Joesville, though more frightened than she nevertheless have forced herself to concentrate on every turn, every sound, and every smell so she could get some idea of where she was being taken. After a while, the horse's hooves were no longer f falling on the cobblestone, but on an earthy track, and the sugar-sweet air of the Chillsville was gone, replaced by green, loamy smell of the countryside. The man who kidnapped Daisy was a large, rough member of the Ichabod Defense Brigade called Private, Bo Private Broad. Spittleworth had told Broad to get rid of this little dovetail girl, and Broad had understood Spittleworth to mean that he was to kill her. Broad was quite right to think this. Spittleworth had selected Broad for the job of murdering Daisy because Broad was found of using his fist and seemed not to care whom he hurt. However, as he drove through the countryside, passing woods and forests where he might easily strangle Daisy and bury her body, it slowly drawn the private broad that he wasn't going to be able to do it. He happened to have a little niece around Daisy's age of whom he was very fond of. In fact, every time he imagined himself strangling Daisy, he seemed to see his niece, Rosie, in his mind's eye, pleading for her life. So instead of turning off the dirt track into the woods, Broad drove the wagon onward, racking his brains as to what to do with Daisy. Inside 
the flower sack, Daisy smelled the sausages of Baron's Town's mingling with the cheese fumes of Gertzberg and wondered which of these two she was being taken to. Her father had occasionally taken her to buy cheese and meat in these famous cities. She believed that it she believed that if she could somehow give the driver the slip when he lifted her down from the wagon, she'd be able to make her way back to Jonesville in a couple of days. Her frantic mind kept returning to her father and where he was and why all the furniture in their house had been removed. But she forced herself to concentrate on the journey the wagon was making instead to shore of finding her way home again. However hard as she listened out for the sound of the horse's hoops on the stone bridge over the Fuma that connected Baronstown and Kurtzburg, it never came because instead of entering either city, Private Broad passed them by. He just had a brainwave about what to do with Daisy, so skirting the city of sausage makers he drove on north slowly she and the meat and cheese smells disappeared from the air and night began to fall private broad had remembered an old woman who lived on the outskirts of jerobe jerobe which happened to be his hometown everyone called this old woman ma ma grander she took in orphans and was paid one ducat a month for each child she had living with her. No boy or girl had ever succeeded in running away from Ma, from Ma Grunter's house, and it was this that made Broad decide to take Daisy there. The last thing she he wanted was Daisy finding her way back home to Joesville, because Spittleworth was likely to be furious that Broad hadn't done what he was told. Though so scared, cold, and unforgettable in the back of the wagon, the rockin' had lulled Daisy to sleep. But suddenly, she jerked awake again. She could smell something different in the air now. Something she didn't much like. And after a while, she identified it as wine fumes, which she recognized from the rare occasion when Mr. Dovetail had a drink. They, they must be approaching Jeroboam, a city she never visited. Through the small holes in the sack, she could see daybreak. The wagon was soon jolting over a cobblestone again, and after a while, it came, to, it came to a halt. At once, Daisy tried to wrinkle out of the back of the wagon onto the ground, but before she hit the street, Private Broad seized her. Then he carried her, struggling to the door of my grunters, which he pounded with a heavy fist. All right, all right, I'm coming, came a high cracked voice from inside the house. There came the noise of many bolts and chains being removed, and Ma Grunter was revealed in the doorway, leaning heavily on the silver-topped cane. Though, of course, Daisy, being still in the sack, couldn't see her. New child for you, Ma, said Broad, carrying and wrinkling sack into Ma Grunter's hallway, which, which smelled of boiled cabbage and sheep wine. Now you might think Ma Grunter would be alarmed to see a child in a sack carried into her house, but in fact, they kidnapped children of so-called traitors that uh, had found their way to her heart before, so she didn't care what a child's story was. All she cared about was the one ducat a month the authorities paid her for keeping them. The more children she packed into her, her, her tumble-down novel, the more wine she could afford, which was really all she cared about. So she held out her hand and croaked. Five ducat placement fee, which was what she always asked for. If she could tell 
somebody really wanted to get rid of a, girl, a child, brought gold, handed over five ducats, and left without another word. Ma Grunter slammed the door behind him as he climbed back in, onto his wagon. Broad heard the rattle of the Ma Grunter's chains and scraping uh, of the hurt locks, even if it had cost him half his month's pay. Broad was glad to have gotten rid of the problem of Daisy Duffdale, and he drove off as fast as he could back to the capital. Oh, poor Daisy. That's very sad.